It's our last lecture for the week, and I hope that you're excited for a wonderful weekend and for your very first problem set. Yes, that's right. This afternoon, we are releasing problem set one. It'll get you a little familiar with all of the concepts that you've done so far, and hopefully actually get you to do something a little bit practical. So today, we're going to move on with a few more features of the C language. We're almost there through the, through the bits that are focusing on programming, and soon we'll get to some more algorithmic thinking stuff. So bear with us while we uh, finish that off. So our topic today is functions. So you can think of a function like a basic input and output machine. So we have some input coming in, let's say inputs A and B. And then we'll have in C a single output. C only supports single outputs, but you'll still learn ways to do multiple, to how to return multiple things, even with this innate restriction. So once we've got our output from our C function, we can then feed it into another function. And in this way, we can chain together different types of applications that we're planning on doing. In C, the way we specify a function is as follows. So first, you specify the return type of the function, what type it's going to give back. Then the name of the function. In this case, our function is f. Then you specify the parameters that the function takes. So we have our input a, which is going to be an integer. Our input b, which let's make this a, uh, a floating type. Then you close off your brackets. And uh, use some curly braces. And inside the curly braces are the body of the function, all of the instructions. So we've already seen a simple example of a function. Which function have we already seen? Main. The main function. So let's take a look at uh, the main function in this demo program. And we'll explain the full demo program in a moment. But let's just take a look at the function signature, at the way we describe the function. So we have the function's return type. Remember, main returns either a 1 or a 0, typically. Uh, we have the name of the function, which is main, and our two arguments. And what are the types of, what's the type of our first argument, at least? That's a fair question. Int. And our second function, uh, the second argument to our function is a pretty complicated type that we'll touch on, hopefully, by the end of next week, you'll be able to understand this one. So we have a few facts to get through about our functions before you're ready to start using them at will. Uh, the first is that functions are, are fun, ha 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 ha. Um, unfortunately not. But a function, we need to get some of our terminology right so that when I'm speaking, you can follow along. Uh, we typically say that a function is run initially by a caller. So something calls a function, and that just means executes it. And we call the function itself the call e. So say inside our main function, we run printf. Which function is the call e? Printf is the call e. It's the function that's being called. And the caller is our main function. Um, the next thing we have to know about functions is how they end. So functions finish when they hit the return statement. And this you would have seen in your prior programming experience. This is common to many programming languages. What the function gives back to the caller, what the callee gives back to the caller, we call the return value. And that is something that you put after the return statement. So let's see how this works in our sample program over here. We have return 0. And so main is running, and when it gets to return 0, main finishes and gives back that 0. We'll see some more complex examples where we chain multiple functions together shortly. Our next function fact is that when a function returns, execution of the program goes back to the caller at the very same point where the function was initially called. It's like at the end of that line. When the function returns back, any variables that that function used are destroyed. So uh, there's a little subtlety here in that C doesn't actually delete things from memory when they're destroyed. Rather, what it does is it just stops keeping track of them. So if you were to open up the computer's memory and poke at it and try and see what's there, you might still find the values from that old function, but they shouldn't be accessible to you, and the program is making no promises about what their value would be. So something else in the computer could feel free to modify that bit of memory. And then when you look back to see those values, you'll notice they've changed, and it's outside your control. So once a function terminates, you shouldn't use 
try and use any of that memory again unless you're recreating new variables. And we'll get into some discussion about memory management next week and get a, a clearer picture of what's going on. There is one exception to this destruction rule, and this is static variables, which we'll see in uh, the next uh, maybe 40 minutes, and if not, we'll see it next week. Um, static variables are special variables that whose value is saved for the next time the function runs as well. So if I have a static variable called counter, and it's inside a function called add, and every time the add function increases counter by one, if you run the function the first time, uh, let's say it starts at zero, you run it the first time, counter will be one. If you run it the second time, counter will be two, third time three, and so on and so forth. But this is only a thing that you can do when you're using static variables or other more advanced features of the C language. When a program, when a function returns, the caller gets back the return value and can then use it in its own control flow. So there's another trap. Either a function signature or the function itself in C must appear before you try and use the function. And what does this mean? We'll see in a second. Because I have a lovely example of how not to write a function. So here I have a basic C program. We have one function main and we have another function main is calling complex stuff. So is this going to compile? No, why is it not going to compile? Joseph, you already answer a lot, sorry. So it will actually compile uh, without a return. That's a, another fun C fact, is the main function or any function is allowed not to have a return, it'll just terminate when it gets to the end of the function otherwise. Yeah, there's no complex stuff. So let's see what complaint it gives us. So clang, oh, I'm not in the right directory here. So this is another common mistake that you might make and that I certainly mistakes, uh, make sometimes. So now I'm in the right directory with all the files. So I'm going to do clang prototype.c. It's going to complain implicit declaration of function complex stuff is invalid. This says that I've used complex stuff, so I've implied that it exists, but I haven't actually made it. And so it's throwing an error and telling me that something's wrong. So what I just said before is that either the function itself or the prototype needs to appear before. So let's try writing a function prototype. This is the description of the function. So like we saw in our little animated demo before, if I do int complex stuff, this is going to say that the function returns an int. What should I type next? Oh, Copilot suggesting it for me. So let's press tab and autocomplete that one. Damn autopilot, making the job too easy for all of you. Um, so this is we're letting the compiler know that we're going to be using a function called complex stuff, and it's going to take one parameter, and that parameter is an integer, and we'll call it a. Will it compile? Yeah, so I still haven't actually declared complex stuff. So let's see what happens. Um, I will do clang, run it again. This time I get a new error message. Undefined symbols, complex stuff referenced from main, symbols not found. What's happening here is that the C program, what it does first is it takes all the source code we've written and compiles it down to assembly code. What it then does, the next step, is it runs secretly a second program called the linker. And the linker's job is to look for all the functions that we've referenced and make sure that they're somewhere in one of our code files. In this case, we only have one code file, so when the linker looks, it sees, oh, comp I've used complex stuff here, maybe it's in one of the other files. But there are no other files, we've only used one file, and so it complains, I can't find what complex stuff is. If complex stuff was in another file, what it would do is it would take the reference to it from our main function and the code in the other place and link them together, such that when you run complex function, it connects to that other piece of code you've written. So what do I need to do to fix this? What was that? It's, 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 on, it's, on, it's on the screen. Oh, it's on the screen? Ha! So this is, again, GitHub Copilot. I'm going to have to turn that off. Um, I have to make the function. This is actually quite funny. This has never happened to me before because this is the first semester I'm teaching where Copilot is enabled. Um, so it suggested this random function, and 
doesn't do anything in particular. So now we've actually made the function. This function is going to set b equal to 3 and just return a plus b. So what should I get as output from my program? This really isn't a hard question. 5. What's wrong? I didn't print it. OK. So now let's go print F. Is this going to work? Why is it not going to work? Let's try it one more time. Ta-da. Our program works. So this shows you all the different ways that things can go wrong and the particular error messages you can get if you try and write a function but haven't remembered to put the prototype in or haven't remembered to put the function body in. And if you remember these errors that you've seen when your code isn't working and you see an error message that looks similar, hopefully this will help you debug it. So let's go back to what we were talking with the, the linker before. The linker is essentially looking for code either in our own source files or in libraries. So if we use printf, without uh, stdio.h, without including that, uh, the linker wouldn't be able to find printf. And so we would have gotten that same error message, unknown symbol linker error. Um, and so a library is really just a set of C functions that someone before us has written to make our lives easier. Because C doesn't seem to have that much built in. And yet there are still a bunch of really obvious things that we want to be doing. Um, there are lots of different fancy ways to build your own libraries. If you're interested, maybe the more comfortable class is going to talk about that. But for now, the main thing you just have to know is to how to include libraries using the include statement. And potentially, um, and potentially how to in add an existing library into your code when the include statement isn't enough. And we'll get to that in one second. My slides are slightly out of order. Um, so what is the C standard library? The C standard library is a library that comes built into the compiler and that automatically is linked to your program uh, by default by the compiler whenever you write a program. And it's got a whole bunch of different things that you can include with it as long as you know the right line to include. So there's character processing, string handling, file handling, networking, random number generation, date and time, and a whole bunch of different things. Um, if you want to do something in C, it's always a good idea first to find out if that thing is included in the standard library. Now there's a catch. Because all of you are undergraduate students uh, trying to learn C and not just to reuse things that other people have built, we are going to, to from time to time impose restrictions on your ability to use some of these standard library functions because we actually want you to practice and learn how to do the things yourself. So here's an example of using a library. We're going to use the math library which until not so long ago wasn't really included as part of the default. And we'll see what I mean by this in a second. So here I have my include standard IO for printf, and I'm also including math.h, and as expected, math.h contains a whole bunch of math. Um, so I'm going to ask for a value for x, and then I'm going to run a whole bunch of functions over it. So printf, what is the sine of x? And then I can call sine of x with, even within that same line. So I don't have to write like int q, oh that should be a float or a double. I don't have to do this. Instead what I can do is I can just copy that over in there and then the sine x will run first, the actual function, it'll save that value inside memory and then when I try and print the whole thing, it will print the correct value for sine x. Now, one kind of like curious fun tidbit is if I write this, the compiler is actually probably going to notice that this is the same thing as the other version. And what it'll actually do is it won't ever create a variable called Q. Behind the scenes, the compiler will just do this version of it because the compiler is clever. It can tell sometimes which code is useful and not useful. And in this case, it can see that all we've done by having that extra line above with that Q variable is make it easier to read. We haven't changed anything meaningful about the program. You can run into a lot of problems if the compiler tries to get too clever, but hopefully in the types of code that you're writing in this class, uh, you won't get to that point. So let's try it out. Enter a value for x. Someone have a nice value for x that you want to get the sign of? 0.7, okay. Now we have the sign, the logarithm, the absolute value, the square root. 
And then what we've also printed are two constants, m underscore pi and m underscore square root two. Now you notice I haven't put a hash defined for these values anywhere up the top, but they're inside math.h. Math.h has hash defines for these, and so if you were to write m underscore pi, you can see now that it's going to expand to 3.14159265353535, et cetera, et cetera. Now, one kind of interesting tidbit that's no longer uh, quite as obvious from this particular program is the way that the linker is including the math library. So up until recently, compilers would actually require you to explicitly include the math library. And the way you do this is with writing dash L and then the name of the library. So in this case, um, our math library is just going to be called M. Um, that's, that's something you'd have to know. You'd have to look it up. You'd look up the math library and see that the right name for it is M. Um, and then we'd write the out like that. However, because math was used so frequently, the compiler writers decided to make it automatic and now you don't have to type dash LM. However, if you want to use another library that's a little bit more out of the ordinary, you'll need to look up what the dash L flag is for the linker so the linker knows to include it in there. Okay, uh, that was fine. We've, we've all seen the sign of a number before. Let's do something a little bit more interesting. I'm still going to keep it to the realm of mathematics, but I promise you this mathematics is going to be useful for something. What we're going to do now is a task called primality testing. So um, what we want to do is we want to find a prime number, potentially uh, the biggest prime number that we can, and then let's find the next biggest prime number, and then a bigger prime number, and then a bigger prime number. And there are a bunch of ways we could do this. One obvious way is to start at uh, three, let's say, and then check if it's prime. If it's not prime, go up and check if four is prime. If four is not prime, check if five is prime. Um, and print all the prime numbers that we find along this way. So we have a, a sample bit of code, and this will give us an insight into how, how it's useful to break things up with functions. Okay, let's go to is prime func. The core idea that I want you to get out of this demo is the idea of abstraction, of breaking up a task like that into multiple different steps. So our task was to find, keep finding larger and larger prime numbers, and the steps to do that would be go to the next number, check if it's prime, if it's prime, print it out. And those things are all distinct steps, so we can actually write out different functions for them. So breaking it up conceptually, we want, would have a function to get the next prime, and in the way inside, inside of next prime, there'd be a loop that counts up. And as it counts up, it goes to the next number and checks, is this particular number prime? So we've separated out the task here. So in this particular program, it's just going to give us the, the single next prime number, but conceptually, it's still the same thing. It's just stopping as soon as it's found one. So enter a number n, get a number from the user, check if the, use, if the number the user just entered was prime. If it is prime, well, the next prime is the number you just entered. Otherwise, just say it's not a prime number. OK, that's fine. If it wasn't prime, then we run next prime over here. And let's dig into how next prime works. So next prime is just a very, very simple loop. It gets the next number, n equals n plus 1. And then if the number it got was not prime, increase n. If that number is still not prime, increase n. If that number is still not prime, increase n, increase n, so on and so forth. Once is prime succeeds, then you know the number, the, you know the number n is now prime, and so return. And if we return, we go all the way back up to next prime over here, which is inside this print statement. So it's not entirely clear because we don't have enough characters room on the screen to see it, but there we go. So next prime is being called inside printf, so printf will just print the outcome, will print the return value from next prime. But we're still missing a piece. Inside of next prime, there is this func other function that we're running, is prime. And this is going to be the mathematical meat of things. How do we tell if a number is prime? Question? Only divisible by itself and one. and one. Okay. So let's see how we do this. What would be a way of checking if a number is divisible by any other number other than itself and one? Give me some steps, like just a description. You use a loop uh, from 
two to uh, square root of n, checking that if uh, a number is, if uh, n is divisible by that iterators, uh, we return false uh, because it's not prime. Otherwise, we complete the loop and return one. Okay, that sounded pretty good to me, but let's slow it down just a little bit so everyone can understand it. So we're gonna have a loop, and the loop's going to start where? And why are we starting at two? What, what would happen if we started at one? So one is we'll uh, consent. If we start at one, the loop will be uh, uh, infinite, right? Would it, is, the num is every number divisible by one? Yes. Yeah, and so if we run a check to say, and we, if we start the loop at one and say, is this number divi divisible by one, we'll always get yes, and that won't tell us anything about primes. So we have to start at two, and then we check, is it divisible by two? If it is divisible by two, it's not a prime. What happens if uh, it wasn't divisible by two? What do we do? We go to three, and if it's divisible by three, then it's not a prime. Otherwise, we go up, we go to four. Is it divisible by four? No, not a prime. Okay, keep going, keep going. Why was, why was Quan's suggestion only to go up to the square root of n? Don't, don't answer this one, someone else. Not Michael, I'm sorry you answer a ton as well. N need someone new. Yeah. Because for any factor pairs, there will be one under the square root of n and one above the square root of n because a uh, square root of n is the largest singular number that you can multiply with itself to get to n. So if there's, if there's a number larger than n that is a factor, uh, square, part of the square root of n that is a factor of n, there must also be one that is smaller. Yeah, so let me, let me put that another way. If you have two numbers that when multiplied together equal a third bigger number, out of those two numbers, one of them is gonna be smaller and one of them is gonna be bigger unless you're talking about a square. So for example, uh, the number nine is three by three, so both of them are equal, but if you're doing, say, the number 10 and you're finding factors of 10, one is two, one is five, obviously out of those two numbers, one of them has to be bigger. And so the idea here is we're looking for the smaller of the factors, which is gonna be less than square root of n. And then the other one we could just figure out because it's the, the missing number from that uh, division. So now let's open up is prime and see how this works. So if n is less than two, return zero because uh, we don't care about looking for primes when the number is less than two. Um, then we have the loop that Quan suggested. So start at two, and we're gonna call this uh, number the divisor because we're looking to see if the larger number, if the number n is able to be divided by the divisor. Okay, so we've done our initialization, we set it to two. If n divided by the divisor leaves no remainder, so remember this is the modulo operator, this gets the remainder from a division. So if there's no remainder when you divide n by the divisor, that means the divisor divides n perfectly. So that, another way of saying it, is there are two numbers, the divisor times some num other number, that when you multiply them together, perfectly equals n with nothing left over, or no gap between the two. So that's another way of stating the same thing. So if there exists, if this number, let's say two to start off with was a divisor, then the number is even, and so it can't be prime. So return zero, it's not prime. However, if, the, if there was a remainder, that means it didn't divide perfectly, so we skip the return zero, and we go back up to the top of the for loop. At the top of the for loop, it says increment by one. So now we're at the number three. Does, is n divisible by three? Let's say no. So we go back up to the top. Is n divisible, now we're at four. Is n divisible by four, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the way up to the square root of n, and this is just another way of writing it. So the divisor squared is less than n, which means the divisor must be less than the square root of n. Is our prime number function any good? Can anyone tell me how many steps, how many times this loop is gonna run? So it's, it starts at one and goes up to, sorry, you've already answered, someone new. Okay, how many times is this loop gonna run? What does it start at? Well, the, the loop is gonna go, it starts at, at two, right? Yep, starts at two, and what does it end at? It ends when the divisor squared is less than n. And what did I just say that's equivalent to? 
The square root of n is the number of times it's going to run, because you go, it runs time one, runs the second time, runs the third time, runs the fourth time, all the way up until we get to the square root of n, where the divisor equals the square root of n, and then this guard is going to fail. So we could say that this function runs in the square root of n. Um, so maybe, maybe this isn't so bad, maybe our function is relatively fast. Can anyone see where I might have a, something wrong with my reasoning here? Now, this is really subtle, so bonus points if you get this one. Uh, yes. And what was your name? Emily. Um, on average, it's not going to go all the way up to the square root of n, and it will generally finish at 1.4. So that is a really good point. Emily, that's excellent. Emily said, you know, on average, numbers aren't prime, so most of the time, it's not gonna, it's, it'll actually be pretty bad. So that's actually a, a really, really, really good thing to point out, and that's what we're gonna call the average case runtime. What about the worst case? Is the worst case gonna be actually root n? It's a really, really hard one. I don't. So that is, Emily's right again, is that it is square root of n, but there's a hidden subtlety. And the hidden subtlety is that integer operations are not actually one operation for the computer. They, the, inside the computer, it actually takes a bit more time as the numbers get bigger and bigger and bigger. Think about when you're doing addition as a, in, if you were in primary school, you draw up this table and the more digits there are, the more like steps you have to do to actually do that addition. And the same is actually true inside the computer. It's really efficient for the computer to do um, arithmetic operation when the size of the number is just the word length of the computer, the built-in word length. But as our numbers get larger and larger and larger, this isn't going to be true anymore. And if we're talking about prime numbers, well, we run out of small prime numbers relatively quickly. And so we're probably going to want this function to work on big numbers, which means that uh, we're not going to be in the world where division is or multiplication is as simple anymore. In fact, we should probably be thinking about how many steps this takes, not in the size of n as a decimal number, but in how many digits it is, because the number of digits is going to give us an indication of really how many steps it's going to take. Just like with your primary school arithmetic, the more digits you add, uh, the harder it's, it's going to, the longer it's going to take you. Here we should probably count, out the, count up the digits. So how do we count the number of digits? We can set the digits, uh, get the digits by taking the log base 2, if it's a binary number, of the number n. And let's make the runtime equal to root n, because that's what we said before. It's root n in the magnitude of the number. So we can do a, a couple of mathematical steps here. Um, and we do our derivation. You can follow along on when I upload, upload the slides. This is really just high school maths. But eventually, we, if we substitute in d instead of, d is the number of digits, instead of n, which was the magnitude of the number, we get that this function is actually going to take 2 to the power of d divided by 2. That's going to be our runtime in the end, in the worst case. So this ends up giving us something that looks exponential. It's big O of 2 to the power of d. And we'll talk about why I dropped the divided by 2 uh, in two weeks' time. So exponential means that as we increase the number of digits, the amount of time that this takes to run grows really, really, really quickly. So for a 2048-bit number, which is actually a, a pretty reasonable number compared to the size of numbers we use in cryptography, we're going to need 2 to the, one th to the power of 1,024 operations. Now, who knows how many atoms there are in the universe, give or take? How many atoms are there in the universe? 10 to the 100? Actually, not that bad. Anyone got another guess? This isn't that hard a game. Jaslyn, how many atoms are there in the universe? Too many. OK, probably also a good answer. It turns out the answer is probably something like 10 to the 80. And this is much, 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 much bigger than that. We're talking 2 to the 1,024. So this is many, many, many doublings larger than that. So for a 2048 number, we need 2 to the 1,024 operations, roughly. This is from a book by Ray Kurzweil, who is a futurist. He studies the future. And he tried to do the calculation of how many operations per second could we do if we built a computer the size of the entire universe. 
And he said that computer should be able to do 10 to the 90 operations per second, assuming that we're using every atom within the observable universe to do our computation. So how does this compare to our 2 to the 1024? This would allow us to do about 2 to the power of 760 operations in the lifetime of the universe. So if we're trying to figure out, um, if we're trying to run our function on a 2048-bit number, it won't run before the universe, it won't finish before the universe ends, even assuming that we're using the entire universe as a computer. So this function is probably not the one we're going to be using in practice if we want to uh, do primality finding on large numbers. So this is called trial division, and it turns out to actually be pretty important because it's used for integer factorization to figure out what primes go into making up an integer. And this is really, really important for cryptography. A lot of early modern cryptography was entirely predicated on the fact that factoring integers into the primes that, that when you multiply them together produces that number is a hard and time consuming thing for computers to do. So even if we improve our algorithm a bit for finding primes and for doing our prime factorization, we need to find an algorithm that's fast enough such that these calculations become something that one can do in a real computer and not have to get a universe sized computer. And this is ultimately why modern cryptography works. It's this idea of finding problems that are so hard for a computer to solve that even solving it on a relatively small or modest input will take longer than the time that anyone will actually ever have available on their computers. So, oh, I must have accidentally pressed the next button. Um, this is an example of actually using it in practice in cryptography with something called the Diffie-Hellman key exchange protocol. This is probably one of the, if you ever study cryptography, which is the, secret, the, the science of how to encode and decode messages and hide information from people, this is one of the first things you'd learn. And I'll give you a very, very short taster overview, as you can see in the corner. This is not assessed, so feel free to put down your pens and just enjoy for a minute. Um, so the idea here is that Alice and Bob uh, want to communicate secretly, and they want to hide a message from Eve over here who's spying on them. Now they want to do this in a way that they can both come up with something that both of them know and Eve doesn't know. So how do they do this? Well first, they agree in public, they put on a notice board in the same town that they live in. Alice and Bob aren't meeting, but there's a, a notice board in the town, and on the notice board they write a really big prime number, and they also write a number G, which is typically, um, a, which is a much, much smaller number called the generator. So they've written this prime number up in the, top, in the town square, they've written this number G, they each go home, Eve goes to the town square as well, the, the spy, Eve, goes to the town square, she sees G and the prime number as well, so she knows them. Now, back at home, Alice comes up with a random secret number and she calls this A. And Bob comes up with a random secret number, he calls it B. Then Alice and Bob each do the computations that you see here. Alice takes the number G and she raises it to the power of E, a uh, power of A, sorry. And then you know how we had this clockwork arithmetic as well, where we, when we got to the number 12, we went back to one? Yeah, so this is the same thing, except the clock now, instead of having 12 numbers, has P numbers. So there's one number from one, two, three, four, five, all the way up to this really big prime. So Alice has computed G to the power of A, and then goes around the clock as many times to figure out where she ends up if she keeps going round and round that many times. Bob does the same thing. He comes up with a secret number B that only he knows, raises G to the power of B, goes round the clock, round the clock, round the clock, figures out where he ends up. And then what they do is Alice sends the result of her computation after she's gone round the clock to Bob, and Bob sends it round to Alice. And now what they do is Alice just received from Bob Bob's computation, G to the B, mod p, and mod p is how we call this process of wrapping around. And then she takes that and raises it to the power of a, her secret number. So Alice has a, and she received from Bob Bob's computation, and so she can raise Bob's computation again to the power of a. And so Alice has now received, uh, Alice has now computed g to the a b mod p. Um, and you can toy around with the actual way modular arithmetic works to convince yourself that this does work out. Now Bob does the same thing, he just, just with his own numbers. So he received from Alice, g to the a mod p, and he has his secret number, b. So he computes g to the a mod p raised to the power of b. 
And now he's also got g to the ab mod p. You'll notice that even though their computations were slightly different, because g to the ab and g to the ba are the same thing, they end up with the same number at the end. They can then use this number to uh, do their cryptography because they know something that Alice doesn't know, and they'll use this as a secret key. And for that, for, to learn how that works, you'll have to take my other class, uh, Information Security and Privacy. But why does this work? This works because Eve, the spy, can't reverse this process that relies on, the, on these properties of prime numbers. So that takes us to the end of our segment on functions, but we've got some more things to learn about the way we use functions. And for that, we're going to hear a little bit of a story that has persisted for I think around a thousand years. Tis said that in the great temple, Benares, beneath the dome which marks the center of the world, fixed into a slab of brass, there are three diamond needles, each a cubit high, and as thick as the body of a bee. On one of these needles, at the beginning of the ages, God placed 64 discs of pure gold, the largest resting on the brass slab, and the others decreasing in size to the top. That is the Tower of Brahma. Night and day, the priests take turns transferring the discs from needle to needle without deviating from the fixed and immutable laws imposed by Brahma. The priest may move only one disc at a time, and he must place this disc only on a free needle or on top of a large disc. When in strict accordance with these rules, the 64 discs have been transferred from the needle on which God placed them to one of the other needles, Tower and Brahms will crumble to dust, and the world itself will cease to exist. So at this point, you're probably getting a bit of a theme from me, something around the end of the world, the end of the universe. That's very much the theme for today's class. And this uh, interesting video is actually the, the text that you just heard, it was me reading out um, part of an 1800s mathematics textbook that was looking at this problem called um, the Towers of Hanoi. Well, it's, this is also a children's puzzle that probably a number of you have played with. The goal of the puzzle is to move all the discs from the place where they started to the next pole along with making sure at any time that you don't have a bigger disc on top of a smaller disc. It should always be in order from largest disc to smallest disc. So here you can see someone moving it around and solving the puzzle. So you can see that at no point does the person uh, accidentally put a bigger disc on top of a smaller disc. Now it doesn't have to be the next disc size up, it just has to be a smaller disc. Uh, no larger disc can ever be on top of a smaller disc. Okay. So let's do a demo of solving this on the iPad. So here is our puzzle. I'm going to start us off with moving all the disks back to A. And our goal here is to, have, is to move all the disks from A to B. Now I need a victim for this game. Okay, who's gonna be the victim? Um, over here. What was your name? Uh, Kaylin. Kaylin. Okay, you are the victim for, for today. Um, it's not such a bad one. We're going to play the game together. So what do I do in order to solve? Can you give me some steps? Tell me which disc to move where. Red one to B. Okay, what do I do now? The yellow to C. Yellow to C. Put the one in B back to A. Wait. <laughs> okay. Oh, wait, sorry. Put the real one back. Let's start it again. Okay. <laughs> Give me some instructions. Um, the red to B. Red to B. And uh, then yellow. Yellow to C. And then put the red one to C. Red to C? Then the green. Green to B. Then 
sorry, the, the red to A, yellow to C. I mean, red to A, yellow, yellow to, to C. C. Yeah, yellow to B. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Then the red to B. Red to B. And then the blue to C. Blue to C. Uh, then red to A. Red to A. Yellow to C? Yeah, yellow to C. Then A to B. Then the, the yellow to A. A, the red to A. Then the green to C. Then red to B. Then yellow to C. So that process was pretty good. It got us all of the move to C instead of to B, but I'd still say we solved the problem. Yeah, round of applause. Okay, so let's move them back. And it was Kaylin. So do you want to tell me how you solved that? That was very impressive. What, what was your strategy? Tell us your secrets. I just moved it around. <laughs> so there, were, there was no systematic, uh, what, what was going through your mind? Like moving some pieces like back and forth. Moving some of the pieces back and forth. Can you be any more specific? I <laughs> just like making sure like this, the pieces are like Okay, so still don't quite have a strategy yet. Can someone else tell me what her strategy was? Because it was, it was effective. Anyone have a description? Okay, here, I'm gonna give you a different version of the puzzle, and then we can hold it, we'll uh, go after. Okay, let's do this same puzzle, but with only two pieces, right? Okay, so now you can all just shout at me, what should I do to solve the puzzle? I want to move uh, both of these things to B. Green to C. A to B. Green to C. Okay, so assuming that I, let's do it instead, let's do it with these two again. I'll do the same process. I'm gonna solve this with the two smallest pieces. I'm gonna move A to C, A to B, and then C to B. Even better, let's do it with one piece. And let's do it with the smallest piece. So we are solving the Towers of Hanoi with one disk, A to B. Okay, what about instead if we solve it with one piece, A to C, but now if we go back to the, when we solved it with two pieces, let's look at what happens. So let's do our solving it from, for moving A to C, the one piece game, except instead of moving it to B, we're moving it to C. Okay, one piece game, we're gonna solve it that way. Okay, now that we've solved it, the one piece version, how do we now finish the two piece version? We solve the one piece version again, except we solve the one piece version from A to B instead of A to C. So let's solve the one piece version again, and then we just move all the disks from C on top here. We do the same thing. Okay, now let's do it with three disks and repeat this process again, and maybe we'll get a pattern. Okay. So we know how to solve the two-piece version, right? To solve the two-piece version, what we first do is solve the one-piece version. So let's solve the one-piece version. Okay, solve. Let's solve the one-piece version again. Now we know how to finish off the two-piece solve. Um, okay, but that's got us onto the wrong disk. So let's reverse that. And it, let's instead solve the two-piece version moving things on to C. So let's, solve, let's just assume we know how to solve the two-piece version already because now I've done it like three times. Let's do the solution for the two-piece version. Okay, solved for two pieces. Now we solve, we move that one disk over and then ju we just solve the two-piece version again. I'm gonna solve the two-piece version moving everything from C to B. And so let's just do that at once. Okay, seems to work. Now we know how to solve the three-piece version. Okay, let's solve the four-piece version. And trust me, you're learning something here. Okay, all four pieces on. So the four-piece version seems a little hard, but I already know how to do something useful. What do I know how to do? I know how to solve the three-piece version. Okay, so let's go and solve the three-piece version. Let's solve the three-piece version. Ah, I made a mistake. I solved the three-piece version onto B, but I really want everything to end up on B, so that didn't work. Let's instead solve the three-piece version, 
to C. Okay, let's solve the three-piece version to C. Then I know how to move one disk, that's obvious. And now what do I have to do to finish? I solve the three-piece version again, but I solve the three-piece version this time moving from C to B. Now who knows what programming te technique this is similar to, and I'll say it out loud one more time. To solve the four-piece version, I needed to know how to solve the three-piece version. To solve the three-piece version, I could solve the two-piece version, and to solve the two-piece version, I could solve the one-piece version. Sorry, Michael, I will promise I will give you a chance next week. Behind you. This is recursion. This is exactly the idea of recursion that you've seen before. To solve a larger problem, first solve an easier problem. To solve an easier problem, solve an even easier problem, and then all you do is layer them together. And with that, have a wonderful weekend. I will see you bright on Tuesday.